Hello, everyone. Welcome to Washington Gun Law TV. I am Washington Gun Law President William Kirk. Thank you for joining us. We talk all the time about our God-given right to defend ourselves and how it's secured to us by the Second Amendment of the United States Constitution and by Article 1, Section 24 of the Washington State Constitution. But we talk all the time here at Washington Gun Law about how it is a right which comes with great responsibility. And unfortunately, sometimes some of us don't live up to that responsibility. And so I thought we'd spend a few minutes today talking about all the different ways you can be ordered to forfeit your firearm in Washington State. Okay, before we get rolling, you guys know the drill. If you like this video, go ahead and click that like button down below. If you want to stay apprised of all issues related to your Second Amendment rights, not only here in Washington State, but on a nationwide level, go ahead and click the subscribe button down below. And if you click the little bell logo down below, you'll be notified when we post new videos. I also really want to encourage you guys to make comments down below. In some of the last few videos that we posted, we've been having some amazing, amazing dialogue back and forth about a lot of really important issues related to our Second Amendment rights. And during the course of those conversations, I've got some great ideas for other videos that we're going to be doing here at Washington Gun Law. So the statute that we're going to be focusing on today is RCW 9.41.098. Now that statute lists nine different ways in which a court of either limited jurisdiction, that is a district or municipal court, or a court of general jurisdiction, such as the superior court for any county in the state, can order an individual to forfeit their firearm. Now, when we talk about forfeiture, what we're talking about is that the firearm needs to be turned over to law enforcement. Does law enforcement get to keep the firearm forever? Well, that depends on the disposition of the case under which the firearm was forfeited. And there is a procedure where if law enforcement wants to permanently deprive the individual of the firearm, that is, take possession of it, never to return it again, uh, RCW 63.32 lays out the methods by which that needs to occur. This video will not focus on the boring procedural mechanisms of that. We're going to focus today about all the different ways that you can end up being required to forfeit a firearm. So RCW 9.41.098 reads as follows. The superior courts and the courts of limited jurisdiction of the state may order forfeiture of a firearm, which is proven to be now, when we're talking about forfeiture firearms, what we're talking about is a temporary status. This is not a deprivation of your Second Amendment rights. That has to occur through due process of the law. That has to occur from a conviction or some other disqualifying event. So this is a temporary forfeiture of firearms. There are nine reasons which the statute says that can happen. They are as follows. A, found concealed on a person not authorized by RCW 9.41.060 or 9.41.070 to carry a concealed pistol, provided that it is an absolute defense to forfeiture if the person possessed a valid Washington concealed pistol license within the preceding two years and has not become ineligible for a concealed pistol license in the interim. Before the firearm may be returned, the person must pay the past renewal fee and the current renewal fee. So the first way is if you are found concealed carrying a firearm, in all likelihood a handgun, and you do not have a valid concealed pistol license, the firearm shall be ordered forfeited. But you can get the firearm back if within the preceding two years you had a valid CPL and you pay your back fees and make your CPL current by paying the current fees, the firearm then shall be returned to you. And this happens occasionally. People uh, forget that their CPL is only good for five years. Everyone right now should grab yours, check your expiration date, and get in line if you have a, a, a renewal coming up in the next six months. Um, but occasionally people will allow them to lapse. They don't realize it until they're contacted by law enforcement. And in those limited circumstances, a person can rectify the situation, pay the back fees, and get their firearm back. The statute lists a couple of other ways in which you can be ordered to forfeit a firearm, including B, commercially sold to any person without an application as required by RCW 9.41.090. Or C, in the possession of a person prohibited from possessing a firearm under RCW 9.41.040 or 9.41.045. So the first section says if a firearm is sold and not sold consistent with the mandatory background checks and waiting periods that every FFL will conduct, if it is sold absent all of those legis legislative safeguards, then that particular firearm shall be forfeited. 
Obviously, the next one is, is if the person is otherwise ineligible to possess a firearm because they have previous felony convictions, domestic violence convictions, mental health incompetency findings, or things such as that, they have been deemed unfit to possess a firearm. If found in possession, not only will the firearm be forfeited, but that particular individual is now facing serious felony charges. The statute lists other ways in which you could end up uh, forfeiting your firearm, including... D. In the possession or under the control of a person at the time the person committed or was arrested for committing a felony or committing a non-felony crime in which a firearm was used or displayed. The statute provides for other ways you can be ordered to forfeit a firearm, including... E. In the possession of a person who is in any place in which a concealed pistol license is required and who is under the influence of any drug or under the influence of intoxicating liquor, as defined in Chapter 4661 of the RCW. And this is a very common one, and let me tell you where it most commonly occurs. In order to carry a firearm loaded in an automobile, you need to have a valid concealed pistol license. However, if a person is pulled over, investigated, and arrested for driving under the influence and search incident to arrest of the vehicle that covers a firearm, then the court may order forfeiture of that firearm if the person is found to be under the influence of intoxicating liquor or drugs. And having been a DUI defense attorney for many, many years in my previous career, I can assure you that I have seen this happen many, many times. And in almost all instances, we were able to get the firearm back for the individual, but not until the case was resolved, which in many instances can take up to a year. The truth of the matter is, is that, again, the lawful and responsible firearm owner will never handle, possess, or use firearms if they're under the influence of any type of intoxicating substance. Section F of the statute says you can uh, forfeit a firearm if... It's found in the possession of a person free on bail or personal recognizance pending trial, appeal, or sentencing for a felony or for a non-felony crime in which a firearm was used or displayed, except that violations of Title 77 of the RCW shall not result in forfeiture under this section. So if you have been charged with a felony, charged with a violent offense, charged with any non-felony offense in which a firearm is alleged to have been used, then the court shall order forfeiture. The only exception being is there are criminal law violations found in uh, RCW Title 77. Now, that's the Fish and Wildlife Code. But there are a litany of criminal offenses that can occur there, some of which have to deal with the possession of firearms when we're hunting. In those limited instances, RCW 9.41.098, this particular statute that we're talking about, does not apply. For all other criminal offenses, however, it does apply. Section G of the statute says a firearm will be forfeited if found in the possession of a person to have been mentally incompetent while in possession of a firearm when apprehended or who is thereafter committed pursuant to Chapter 10.77 of the RCW or committed for mental health treatment under Chapter 71.05 of the RCW. And these are our involuntary commitment statutes where, the, where a judge has actually ordered a person into mental health treatment for their own safety. And then the last two ways in which a person can be ordered to forfeit a firearm are found in section H and I. They read as follows. H. Used or displayed by a person in violation of a proper written order of a court or general jurisdiction or I. Used in the commission of a felony or a non-felony crime in which a firearm was used or displayed. And again, both of those should make perfect sense to you. If a court has previously ordered you to not possess firearms and you are now possessing firearms, that firearm will be ordered forfeited as well. If you have been charged with a crime in which a firearm is alleged to have been occurred, felony or otherwise, then that particular firearm will be ordered forfeited in all likelihood because it will be kept for evidence. Now, a majority of RCW 9.41.098 talks about the procedural mechanisms necessary for law enforcement to permanently deprive that individual of a firearm or what happens when a firearm is no longer needed for evidence. There is some outs, some exceptions to subsection 1 of the statute, and that is found in subsection 3 of the statute. There are ways that a person could avoid forfeiture of the firearm altogether. In subsection 3, it reads as follows. 
The court shall order the firearm returned to the owner upon a showing that there is no probable cause to believe a violation of subsection 1 of this section existed, or the firearm was stolen from the owner, or the owner neither had knowledge of nor consented to the act or omission involving the firearm which resulted in its forfeiture. So the circumstances under which the firearm would not be forfeited is then if the firearm did not was stolen from the owner and then used in the commission of a crime by somebody else, obviously the owner should not lose that firearm. However, I've had this situation involving an AR pistol that was stolen and that individual has not received their firearm back because it is being kept as evidence for the theft of a firearm case that's coming up later this year. The statute also says, listen, if you are charged with an offense, whether it's a, a DUI in which a firearm was found in the car, it's a felony, it's a non-felony, but it involves a firearm, it's a domestic violence offense, it's any one of these things that can then order the forfeiture. If the court later finds that there is no probable cause, that is, you make your first appearance on that charge and the court finds no probable cause at that point, or later on there is a probable cause determination, a hearing set by defense counsel in which the court rules that there's insufficient probable cause, that is, there is a lack of evidence to support a reasonable suspicion that criminal activity has occurred there. That is, there is an insufficient evidence to support by preponderance of evidence, more likely than not, that the crime charged occurred. If that standard is not met, the courts are told to, in fact, dismiss the case. And when that happens, the firearm shall be returned to the owner. Listen, you may have more questions about forfeiture firearms or anything related to your Second Amendment rights. And if you do, don't ever hesitate to contact us here at WashingtonGunLaw.com. Or, of course, you can call us directly at 425-765-0487. Listen, part of being the lawful and responsible gun owner is to know what the law is in every situation and how it applies to you in any instance that you may find yourself. Until next time, thanks for watching and stay safe.